Flurry. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to Myth Vision. I have Dr. Joseph A.P. Wilson joining me today. How are you, my friend? I am doing well. I'm doing, it's been a hectic week, a uh, crazy winter term. I was teaching and dealing with all kinds of hectic stuff. So it's it's good to be here. Good to be with you. And and today is turning out to be a little better than I hoped. So. Hey, I'm I'm just glad you made it. I know that you have snow, we have snow, and and we have Buddha to talk about. So I guess the ancient Buddha uh, somehow just in a statue form walked all the way from the east and just plumped himself in Egypt. What, what what's going on? Uh, <laughs> take us into what's happening. What's the recent discovery? And uh, yeah. Well, okay, so it turned out I had two windows open, and I was hearing the the, the audio twice overlapping. So I think I just muted one of them. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, where's the live one? That's hit that like button, everybody. Yeah. All right. All right. Did you find me? <laughs> it's okay. The problem is I'm I, I'm not done live before. Okay. Okay. And um, and because I've never done live, I've got it out of sync. Got can, it. Can you help me that? Yeah. So I imagine. Are you in the Streamyard? It might be. Oh, I I was, and then I tabbed over to YouTube. So if I close the YouTube page, it should work, right? Close the YouTube. You don't need YouTube up. You want to come over to the Streamyard. Yeah. And what happened to my Streamyard? Like I have too many tabs open. That's my problem. <laughs> Just open the email and then. Click back on that. Yep. <laughs> I am sorry for being, oh, is this it? It's it. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. It was because YouTube was in the background and it was, the, the sound was coming through twice and I was losing my mind. I okay. Go back that. and I apologize to your audience for, for being a, a, a Luddite and a person without any, a clue here. Um, so to, to just talk about the significance of this finding. So this is, Berniki, Egypt is a, um, it's a port city in Southwest Egypt that would have been a place where the Indian Ocean trade from uh, our, our people, boats coming around the Arabian Peninsula and up the Persian Gulf would then land at this little peninsula right on the coast. And so it was a place where you had people from the broader, you know, trade world were congregating in one little Egyptian place. But this is a massive find because it shows a second or third century Buddha statue that is most likely, according to the reports I've read, I need to get in touch with these people and find out some more details about like the nitty gritty of the excavation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, um, and this is new to me, this was found in 2022, but it's, it's only just kind of getting out there in general knowledge right now. So it, I, I discovered this like last week or the week before. This object is locally made, according to them. That's a huge big deal. And it's part of a continuum of Indian presence in Egypt because there are Sanskrit inscriptions that come from a later period in this site, right? That show that so there is a there is like a, a, an Indian diaspora community there. And at that time, that's the Mauryan Empire. That that's the time when Buddhism is rapidly expanding in India. We think of India is a Hindu country now, but during the ancient and medieval period, there was a long period of about a thousand years when Buddhism was close to the majority religion. There was a time when India was almost like a, a Buddhist theocracy. Wow. So if this would have this would have been earlier in that period, this would have been before Buddhism was like that big there. But Buddhism was a major Indian religion, and so there are Indian people in Egypt practicing Buddhism in the second and third century. That is a big deal. We have some evidence that people in Egypt knew about Buddhism because there are early Christian authors that mention it. They mention the Buddha, they mention the, the practices associated with his religion. Um, and initially they do it positively. Early Christian authors, like I'm thinking mainly Clement of Alexandria. Mm. When he talks about Buddhism, he talks about it as something that's happening in India that's similar to what Christianity is doing in the West, right? He, see, he, he sees an affinity between the two religions and the fact that the Buddhists are especially pious and holy people in his view, right? They're not, he doesn't, tra he doesn't talk about them like they're heathen idolaters the way that later authors do, 
right? So wow. at that early phase, you have this sort of like a brief moment in time when you had this sort of like common cause that was seen between these two different religions. And so this would have come from that same period. This Buddhist statue in Egypt would have happened, would have appeared around the time that the earliest Christian sources citing the existence of Buddhism in India are, are, are recorded. This is a huge big deal because it, it's also around the time the era, the general 150, 200 year window we're talking about is the period when in, in Persia, in Babylonia, you have this competing world religion called Manichaeism that gets founded. And it's a sister sect of early Christianity with a lot in common with early Christianity. It eventually went, went extinct by the late medieval period. Right, it went, but it, it was a ma massive, major world religion in both the West and the East for a very long time, and it synthesized Buddhism and Christianity. Hmm. And it happened right after Cle Clement's period. So Clement of Alexandria is an older contemporary of Mani of Babylonia, the founder of Manichaeism, who thought of, saw himself as both a Christian and a Buddhist simultaneously. Hmm. So my interest in this, and this comes, I, I, pub, I um, haven't published this yet, but I have presented a paper at the American Academy of Religion three years ago, one of the pandemic conferences. Um, and so the manuscript there is awaiting some revisions, and I'm going to have to incorporate this new find because it's yeah. really, it's crucial. It's a crucial kind of missing link here, right. showing physical evidence. But the fact that it's made local, it's probably made out of imported Western Turkish rock because this period in late Roman Egypt, you don't have, you don't have um, lots of local quarries that are still, you know, local quarries in Egypt got tapped out a long, long time ago. So people who carve religious objects, right, they're going to be importing the raw materials for those workshops. So I think that the, the, the piece that I read, which was admittedly not a peer reviewed publication, but, but a kind of a popular, you know, report, it suggested that the, 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 the raw material may have been imported from Asia Minor, but then carved locally. Wow. All right. And so um, at some point, we're going to put up some pictures of this stuff. L let me go ahead and get this PowerPoint going. And forgive right. me if we do get any super chats. I promise you I'm not ignoring you. I can't see. I'm only able to see the PowerPoint on my screen. Oh. And then we will, once we get finished, I'll let you blast through it, uh, Dr. Wilson, and then you know, give the highlights what you want, and then we'll come back at the end and try to tackle anything if we have the time. That's wonderful. And if you want, and if we're not rushed and you want to pause and exit the PowerPoint periodically so that we can do other things, that's fine. I, I don't have to. I'm going to follow your lead. I, I think okay. it's, that sounds it's good. only fair that I, that I think we do that because you're the guy who knows what he's talking about with this stuff. So just tell me when and I'll All hit right. next and we'll go. So you can hit next and get past the, the, the cursory little s s title slide. So what people need to realize is that Buddhism, when it became a world religion, so when, so Buddha, the, the historical Buddha lived like 500 BC, he's probably born near Nepal. Some people debate about where exactly he was. His historicity, he's, he's generally regarded as a, a real historical person. Although, you know, like, like any ancient person that, from that period, you can't be 100% sure that he's not a myth, but he's definitely... Got most people believe he's a real guy that lived in India 500 BC. And then for a few centuries, the monastic movement that he founded was pretty much oral based. But then around, um, well, you know, a, a, a generation or two after he's gone, they start writing down his, his uh, story, his biography and everything else become, and it, and it forms the sort of scriptural canon, massive Buddhist scriptural canon. So we, we have like, in the West, in Western religions, you have like small canons, like a few books that we call the Christian Bible. They're bound together. The Buddhist scripture, the Tripitaka, the Three Baskets, is enormous. You could fill like entire libraries with the sacred texts of Buddhism. They never closed the canon, and it expanded and grew in all different ways. So Buddhism is incredibly diverse religion with very big, huge differences between different forms of Buddhism. But early Buddhism which is, you know, again, different in a lot of ways from later Buddhism, right? Just like early Christianity doesn't really look like post-medieval Christianity. In a lot of ways, it's very different religion. So early Buddhism, we don't know a lot about it in all different places, right? Early mm -hmm. Buddhism had a lot of variation that, that is lost to us because the texts are lost. And one of those important things is 
that the first Buddhists outside of India on the overland trade routes were missionizing to the Greeks. And so it's one of the first missionary, successful missionary religions. They, they're, they're, they're missionizing to the Greek, the Hellenistic kingdoms of Western Central Asia. So we're talking about the, 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 the post-Seleucid period. So after it's no longer like under direct control of the Greek empire, but, and Persia has, is rising up and reclaiming its sort of, um, over this, over these generations, Persia is revitalizing, right? And becoming less Greek, but the peripheral areas of Central Asia retain that sort of Greek cultural value that, that, that they, the, the, the semi-autonomous kingdoms or, or autonomous kingdoms of West Central Asia that are Turkish, I mean, not Turkish, that are Persian and Greek simultaneously, they don't reject Greek culture the way that the Babylon and the heart of Persia like are like, we're not, we're, we're not Alexander's subjects anymore, right? We're not, we're not following those Greek and Roman rulers. But you have this part of Central Asia where Greek cultural capital remains strong. Where, where you have indigenous Persian, you know, tribal lords, but they still like see Greek culture, Greek literature as cool. And it's in that phase that you have like early Central Asian Buddhism has this strong Greek aesthetic quick character, like the, the statues are depicted using Greek like iconography and text. So go one, one slide ahead. I think I have a picture of that's one of the oldest images of the Buddha we have is there on the left. Wow. That is a, uh, and from right around the time Jesus was born. And what language do you notice that his name is written in? That looks Greek. That is absolutely. So this is one of the first surviving images of the Buddha that we have on earth. And his name is inscribed in Greek. Wow. So early Greek Buddhism is lost to us still because there would have been, of course, a lot of written texts a lot of those many diverse like literary strands of early buddhism and they're you know like the the, the sectarian landscape of early early buddhism is quite mysterious and enigmatic and it's undoubtedly the case that the early western form the early form of buddhism that was spreading through the greek diaspora in the periphery of the persian world would not have necessarily matched the later forms of buddhism that we all know so we have to kind of make guesses about what early Greco Buddhists thought and did. But one of the things they thought and did was they thought it's cool to depict humans as go like hu gods in human form, right? So the Buddha hadn't previously been depicted as a, uh, he had been depicted an icon an iconically, right? Early mm -hmm. Buddhists did not de usually depict him in art. They depicted like hit evidence of his presence, like symbols that he was associated with. You might have a footprint that said he walked on earth, right? But he, he's gone into the highest nirvana. His physical form is no longer, no longer part of earth as we know it. So there was this early tradition of not actually depicting him. But once the Greeks got a hold of it, right? Like we make, we have Buddhist statues because of the Greek like obsession with idols with, you know, with making uh, gods in human form that you could worship. And so, yeah, so that that's a, it's crucial in the history of Buddhism, that Greek decision to anthropomorphize like the concept and, and turn it into, you know, turn turn the Buddha into a statue. So, well, and now, so that is the one that we've just discovered in 2022 in, in Egypt. And I what I notice those. about it, yeah. is it's got a very Persian style halo. The halo itself is likely introduced to Christian art from Buddhist art. And, and again, we don't have like rock solid evidence here. It's, it's, it's misty. And one of the problems is that academic study of Western religion and Eastern religion are siloed, right? We don't have enough specialists who are trying to bridge the gap. So I'm, I'm one who's aspiring to try and bridge the gap a little bit here between you know, Central Asia and and the Greco-Roman world. These these are not different planets. They have cultural 
traits in common at the same time and they're linked geopolitically throughout yeah. this period but we ignore that that sort of like frontier interaction between Greece and Persia during these key centuries these ex crucial centuries where you got Christian art and Christian monastic cultures both get established in Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean at this time so like hmm. where are the earliest Christian monasteries and when the same period in time that we're talking about. This Buddha is in Egypt at the time when some Christians are starting to organize the religion along as like into, into monasteries and convents, which is a Buddhist thing long before it's a Christian thing. It, it just comes out of nowhere to some degree. Now, asceticism is a part of Judaism and Christianity. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the ascetic lifestyle or the, the, the virtues of what we would consider to be the behaviors of monks and nuns, I'm not saying that those are introduced from, from Buddhism, right? Those are obviously indigenous to Western religion. But what I'm talking about is more the institutional character of the monastery, right? Its structures, its, its, its bureaucracies, its kind of like the like the like the the attire the material culture of monasticism right mm -hmm. the way the physical objects that are associated with it the behaviors like shaving the head and all that stuff that we associate with both monks in the east and monks in the west they do things that are similar and that, that are not just generically like like John the Baptist lifestyle right it's not mm -hmm. we're not talking about just like living in the desert we're talking about the physical rituals that are associated with organized institutional monasticism so I think that the presence of a of a multi generational Buddhist community indigenous to Egypt in the third century is a huge big deal for that region reason, and so um, again because the, the 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 article suggests that this Buddha statue the one on the right there is uh, is made locally and it's older substantially older according to their estimate than the late third mid third century sanskrit inscription so they have a securely dated in, uh inscription in sanskrit a language of ancient india that is at this site and they say that this buddha is from somewhat earlier they call it the earlier roman period so it could be as old as that coin in theory i'm not necessarily wow. leaning that way my yeah, instinct yeah. from the style is that it's probably second century maybe third century but the point is we're still dealing with decades long period of an indigenous community. Well, I should say indigenous. They're probably diaspora Indians, but they're making this stuff locally, right? Right. These are locally made objects, meaning that the, the community is practicing Buddhism here in Egypt at this time. Um, it's as part of a larger pagan temple complex. So they're not, but that that's the way Rome, Roman religion worked, right? Mm -hmm. Religions weren't segregated. It wasn't until Christianity came along and said, you can't have any other, you know, it's just, it's us or nobody. Right. right? Pagans were much more like pluralistic. They were like, okay, add another God. To me, it's much better. I, I think yeah. it's a, it's add a cool another God to our, to our collection. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Oh, then I want to say something. I'm yeah. really disappointed, though, that the Buddhist statue is missing his right hand. Because hmm. I believe that that right hand, like the, the coin there, the Buddha is making an important gesture. It's the gesture of fearlessness. It's the Abhaya Mudra. So this is a, one, of the most, um, one of the most fundamental uh, symbols in early Buddhist art is this, the hand that's raised up like this in a... In a in, a sign of fearlessness. And we'll get into that. So let's move on and we'll talk more about the Christian and Manichaean connection. So there, there's just a map. So those are the trade routes from that go all the way from China to the Eastern Mediterranean. And you'll see that the Greek Buddhist area that we were talking about, where the where the Greco-Buddhist art originates, is right around that middle part of the Silk Road that I'm showing here, right? So you have like, um, Bactria, that's the right in the middle of the map. That's like the the ground zero of Greek Buddhism. And you can see that those caravan routes that were flourishing in antiquity, right? The so-called Silk Road, where people were moving the trade between Central Asia and, and the Eastern Mediterranean, which is where Christianity originates, is these are not separate planets. These are geopolitically and economically connected to each other 
for the duration of this period, right? And we're, we, we ignore it. So then I show you down there, Bernicke is a coastal port in Southwest Egypt on the Red Sea. So it's much more likely to be supplied with its Buddhism and you know Indian culture via the, uh, the, the oceanic trade routes around the Mediterranean Peninsula. But nonetheless, they're, if they're getting the rock from the north, it's all an integrated world here. It's not like these are different planets. Okay, next slide. So the key period in time here is the third century. So do your viewers or do you, Derek, know what the what was happening in the Roman Empire in throughout the third century? This is crucial. Um, like historically in terms yeah, of the, that period, that period from the early to mid to late third century is a it's called a crisis. I am thinking of the rise of Christianity in terms of its political power, but I mean, I, I honestly right. don't. So Christianity is getting organized. It is the period I, when Christianity is getting organized, when the Orthodox movement is really getting legs, and, right. Right, and they're and they're saying they're 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 pushing out the the heretics in various forms, right? So the third century is a crucial period in the early in early Christianity. It's also when you get sporadic persecution of Christians. Not as not it's not like the the myth of of total persecution from day right. one all the time. The religion obviously grew and expanded in in periods, right? But it was during the third century when the when official state sanctioned persecution of Christians happened spirit, uh, sporadically. It was, there were periods of genuine physical hostility against Christianity, scapegoating it for the problems of the empire. The crisis of the third century was when late imperial Rome was at its weakest in history. Mm -hmm. It was the one time that Persia was more militarily more powerful, right? So it was like the moment when Rome almost collapsed under its own weight. And, and, and it's it's the period we call the barracks emperors, emperors, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the barracks emperors, right? when you have basically a bunch of military leaders running Rome an assassin and an epidemic of political assassination that happened that causes basically multiple emperors to be, you know, like a rinse and repeat cycle of regime change in Rome. So it's Rome is incredibly weak. This is the period when um, at least one Persian emperor captures and kills a Roman emperor. Right? There's a monument to it. Right. In, and so this is really a, a, the weakest point in in Rome's political history. And the point when foreign religions are being scapegoated most as a result of their, like they're blaming, you know, the xenophobic hostilities against foreign cultures that is associated with this like period of great instability and chaos. But this is a period when Greco Buddhism in Persia, there's a long period in East Central Asia when the Hellenistic Buddhist art production, so art uh, that is Greek and Buddhist, is thriving. So it's the, mm -hmm. the very, like, the, the, the moment when Rome is at its weakest and Persia is at its strongest is the time when Greek, Greek Buddhism on the east border of Persia, so going clear away from the Western Empire. And right, the, away and, from and, Rome, and, central Rome. Yeah, right. so you're getting far away from Rome here, but you're seeing that Hellenistic art isn't dead. Right. Even though the crisis of the third century is a period when culturally Rome is weak and isn't doing much, there isn't like a lot of like burgeoning art in, in the, from that period in Rome. But there is a related Greco-Buddhist style that is happening in the much more politically staged, stable regions of East Central Asia. Okay, next slide. By the way, I just want to ask you about this art on the left. Yeah. Are we getting to that at some point here? Oh, I, you know what? I have so many pieces of art I could talk about. All. That's the emaciated Buddha. So when the Buddha is, and you see the, the halo, right? Yes. That whole use of the halo as um, uh, in art, in, in monumental art, it is earlier in Buddhism than it is in Christianity. So that round halo you see behind the head in yeah. Christian art, that happens later. And it is most definitely, in my opinion, has to be stimulated by Buddhist art. Because okay. the particular forms you see in Buddhist art are so similar to the Christian one. So the, the emaciated Buddha is like he's fasting to the point of starvation. Here. I noticed that, yeah. Right, it's and it reminds me a little bit of like later plague crucifixes, you know, like medieval crucifixes where they show 
like the body like a corpse, like, yes. a, like a rotten corpse on the cross, because it's there, he's he's being identified with the the massive <laughs> dead pe number of dead people in in, in the plague period. And the but one down below is symbol that's of like the lack of necessary, like physical, like who cares about the physical, like you know right. what I mean? Like, yeah, it, and then below below that, below, huh. that is, um, below that below that is below that is the uh the temptation of by mara so there's a similar scene in the buddhist story you know how the, jesus goes out in the wilderness and the devil the devil tempts him to like he says i'll give you all these kingdoms turn this yeah turn the the this bread into uh the rock and the bread. Into the bread and stuff like that and he, he rubs him there's a very similar passage in buddhist scriptures where mara who is like the buddhist devil the lord of illusion with his daughters tries to tempt him away to prevent him from getting enlightenment and he does the same thing. He uses he masterful, masterfully rebuffs the efforts of uh, Mara, Lord of Illusion, to destroy his concentration and prevent the. the <laughs> so it's a it's an important one. And then the, the one on the upper right that's a Bodhisattva, which is a, a I forget which one it is. It might be Maitreya, the future Buddha, like the second coming of the Buddha from the next world. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Uh, I don't remember for sure which. So the problem with those those Gandhar and Bodhisattva statues is they're hard to identify. Got it's like it. You know what the kind of category of deity it is, but it's hard to say for sure which particular Buddhist character is being represented in some of them. And then the one at the bottom is the Pari Nirvana. So that's when the Buddha eats rancid pork given to him by a devoted student. Right? He's give because he, you eat what is bef put before you. Right, right. You, you, when, when you're a monk and you're begging, you beg for food. Someone gives you food, you eat it. You don't say this. I didn't want this. This is my. This is my thing. You eat whatever's right. given. So he was given like bad pork, and he died of some foodborne illness, and then his body dissipates. Right. He I literally was thinking of Socrates, like in art that I've seen of Socrates laying there like that. But then again, I'm throwing right. spaghetti at a wall. Right just, now, now if we were to go into this, we could talk a lot about the way that Hellenistic art. Man, of, and we'll, we'll have some more examples actually. So, okay, okay, on. let me show. I'll up. definitely have some better examples to show you exactly how Hellenistic figures get represented in, I mean, or Greek motifs get transformed in both Buddhist and Christian ways, right? Got Whether it. the same the same source gets right divided into different cult cultures. So go on. Next slide. Okay, so yeah, this is just a screen cap from Wikipedia showing the number of emperors in this like. 25 emperors in 50 years or something like that in the middle of the third century just give you an idea of how awful it was to be in 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 the center of rome at that time it meant that there was a like perpetual bloodbath and it meant that artisans right the people who are by the way these aren't famous artists it wasn't like michelangelo they didn't have like prestige back then they were just working class people if you were a stone carver who made statues it was just a trade like building or anything else. It wasn't like we didn't have like e uh, uh, cults of personality around famous sculptors. So if, you're, if your job was to carve sarcophagi, right? Imagine you're Biff with your chisel and Biff's job is to make fancy funeral furniture. Rich aristocrat, he's going to croak and he wants a fancy tomb with all that cool art. And you get hired to do that. Do you imagine that people doing that in this period, in this place, would have had a lot of work, a lot of oh. stable work? Maybe, maybe not. Now, nah, it would have been so chaotic the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, that this would have been, and we don't have a lot of art, this would have been a period when talent would, would leave. So my argument in my paper is that there is a socioeconomic push-pull migration force across the border, right, with, with, with Greco-Persians in East Central Asia being a place where artisans would be moving when their employment was less stable in the heartland, mm -hmm. right? And it's at the same time that you have like sporadic persecution of Buddhists. I mean, not Buddhists, of Christians. Buddhists are doing fine. But the Christians that are getting sporadically persecuted, right, that's another thing that acts as a push force in migration theory, a pull force in my in like so, social scientists who study migration between countries, you'd say, you'd say a pull force is an economic opportunity. 
a mm -hmm. stable political empire where you can go and work and do your make your art and live. A push force is my sect is being attacked by, you know, by the state or by, you know, whatever. There's some reason I'm on the outs. I'm associated with the hated foreigners for some reason. And they want me, uh, they, they don't let me coexist peacefully. Got it. And um, so, yeah, so, so this is my feeling is that during these periods of persecution in the empire, in the Roman Empire, you end up with a um, uh, a, a safe, a more ho hospitable place in East Central Asia. And then, so next slide. Okay. Then Monarchism is uh, emerges right at the very moment we're talking about. So Mani, who is this? He's a Jewish Christian kid born in Babylon. Well, he was wasn't born Jewish Christian. His family converted when he was a like small child. Okay. Converted to Jewish Christianity. So this would have been like similar to the, what the Ebionites were doing, right? So they were outside of the Roman Empire. They were not part of the the proto Orthodox form. They would have been Christians who ate kosher, right, and didn't necessarily think highly of Paul uh, initially. Although Mani later did. Mani later thought himself thought of himself as the second coming of Jesus the second coming of Buddha, the second coming of Zoroaster, and the second coming of Paul. He was like all these, you know what I mean? He was the culmination. He was the new it, right? The culmination of all these traditions, according to him. So he's born, he, his family converts to Jewish Christianity. From a very young age, he regards himself as a prophet who fulfilled. And he's in Persia at a time when Buddhist missionaries are active, when the Zoroastrian state religion is institutionalizing, because early on, Zoroastrianism was like a folk religion, right? It was more like a tribal religion originally. It didn't have like the, the it did, well, didn't have like a theocratic character, right? So it's during Monik, Mani's lifetime that like the institutions that we think of as Zoroastrian are beginning to form and solidify, right? Like it becomes a, it becomes a, a bureaucratic thing. Buddhist missionaries are coming from the East and he is part of this thing, Christianity, right? That's that's a Western religion. And in Persia at the time, all three religions were local, right? These were not foreign religions. These would all have been seen as Persia. So why during his lifetime did he get such, he had a lot of success for a period uh, with patronizing the Persian royal court because it, they saw it, especially at a period when, when Rome was weak and falling apart, they saw a religion like Manichaeism which combines Christianity, Buddhism, and Zoroastrianism, they saw it as potentially an asset because it can unify the empire, right? You take the, the, you take the Persians that live in different regions of your domain that practice different religions, and you say they're all part of one religion, right? It's, it's, like, it's like wrapping it up and tying it with the bow. So he went through a, a period when he was really successful and that's when he started, he grew the religion during his own lifetime. And then some one of the members of the Persian court died, who was his like protector and patron. And his younger brother rose to power. And that caused him, and, and his younger brother was favored by Orthodox Zoroastrians who hated the Manichaeans. Because the Orthodox Zoroastrians were like, who is this guy? Right? He's he's claiming to be Zoroaster. No. And so the Orthodox Manichaeans were responsible for the martyrdom of Mani. Mani gets put to death. How it happens is hard to say. There's different, there's contradictions. He either died in prison or he's flayed alive or he's crucified. He gets referred to as like he's crucified. So his claim to be Jesus, right, fits in with the whole fact that many of his traditional accounts of his martyrdom is through crucifixion. And so you get this religion that moves that grows and expands and gets bigger on the trade routes after the, the prophet is put to death. Mm -hmm. And it becomes hugely popular in North Africa. It becomes popular throughout Egypt. And again, the earliest Christian monasteries and the earliest Manichaean monasteries were simultaneously being founded in Egypt during this period. So I don't think it's purely Buddhism that we're talking about as the key between 
the key, the key go between here. I see Manichaeism, which went through a period in this early phase when it was very successful, very powerful. It was um, including in the Roman Empire among Romans, right? That this is one of the ways that Buddhism and Christianity get blended, right? Not it's the the Orthodox form received some of the you know how shall we say uh, com combined Buddhist Christian elements from the Manichaeans without even realizing that they were because it was just part of the cultural fabric at that point. So next next slide. Yeah, he also probably feeds what eventually becomes early Islam a little bit. A, a number of early Islamic titles were first used by Manichaeans. Like Somani was the messenger of God, the seal of the prophets, right? So things that we say about, about Muhammad, things that Muslims say about Muhammad, Manichaeans said about Mani first. So, right. so Islam is some of its institutional character, some of its like structure was borrowed from Manichaeism. And so that, and just go back to say that where, where do we see this Buddha statue that we just found? We see it on the coast of the Persian, Persian Gulf, right across from the Arabian Peninsula. So this is going to be a period when, you know, the Arabs could be involved in this too. There's so much I thought of too. Just, I thought about Muhammad and how he crafts this new version of their religion in a way by using existing pre-existing traditions and such too. So it's really interesting that if we look at Manny as an example of how a new religion can be constructed using prior traditions and blending them, I think we find something like that happening also down there with, uh, with the Muhammad. So. I have a very quick text to send. It will only be one second. Okay. Do you want me to back out? Or are we good? No, I'm. I, it's so awesome. It's just. It's just a miscommunication with a family member. It will not take. Oh, you're texting. I thought you. Yeah, I'm just sending a text. So that's just why I'm, <laughs> I'm, my my mind's off this. No, no worries. No worries. He is a family man, ladies and gentlemen. Just yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's. You're never free. So and, and, this and, is. Um, oh, sorry. You're done. No. What were you saying? I was yeah. just going to say that I'll get to the super chats as soon as we're done with the PowerPoint. I'm yeah. trying to keep my eye on the uh, chat as much as I can on my phone, on my hands, but here I am watching okay. the screen too. So. If you need to take a pause so we can do some super chats, you can yep. do that. So we'll do it at the end. Yeah, so, we'll so yeah. So go ahead and skip forward. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll, so yeah, I, I said this already. He's, okay. so these are just a, a few of the things that early monastic forms of Christianity and Buddhism have in co common. Right, they the, the attire that monks and nuns well wear, the fact that they shave their heads, the fact that they have ideas about like alms giving, self mortification, right, where you like you like do corporeal abuse of your own body, you know, like a, like you take a stick and beat yourself on the back with it, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Buddhist monks and Christian monks do that. Uh, meditation, celibacy, right? Uh, the use of bells, believe it or not, is one of these things that come that it's not. We take these things for granted. We think of them as like normal, but they weren't universal customs in the past. These were specific customs that seem to have a specific origin. The rite of confession, which I don't know if you're aware of this, the rite of confession originally was only in monastic settings, right? Early Christians had public penance when they when they confessed and sinned. You would like wear sackcloth and ash and and have like ashes. Like I I. I I had an affair with, with my whatever somebody like I, I end up getting busted for some moral transgression, that kind of thing. So you would get like publicly humiliated for a long period of time. And that was the only way you could undo your sin, because once you were baptized, right, you were supposed to stop sinning. Right. So after baptism, it meant that you were on the hook. You were you were definitely on the hook. <laughs> but that was not very popular. Can you imagine no. That that wasn't a, that 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 early Christianity was not it was not very popular. Whereas in monastic settings where monks are trying to like work on each other's discipline, then they commit they can they confess to each other very small sins all the time. Like you know, like I had a wet dream last night or something like that. You know what I mean? There's like this. There was a much different practice in the monastic setting, and then in Irish monasteries they said, "Hey, wait, everyone can do this." 
right? And so in, in, it was the Irish that took the what was a monastic practice and popularized it in the medieval period, and it became something that lay people did too, right? It's, it's right. an important sacrament in Western Christianity. But early on, it was part of the monastic institutional program, right? And so, and then the use of relics and reliquaries, the fact that people venerate the bones of the dead. And I'm here, we come back to Manichaeism again. Buddhism did it first. Manichaeism starts a huge fad around 274 when Mani is martyred. His disciples go and they collect his hands, right? And they venerate the physical remains of Mani of Babylonia. This is exactly when, if you're familiar with the work of Candida Moss and her book, The Myth of Persecution, mm -hmm. when does she say the reliquary obsession and the martyrdom cults in Christianity really take off? Right around this time. It's like in the decades beginning, and this is when the major persecution of Christians under like Diocletian and all that stuff is first happening. Mm. And, and, oh, here's another thing. So like after Monty's death. Here's another thing. The persecute the state sanctioned persecution of Christians, it coincided with the state sanctioned persecution of Manichaeans. Wow. So when when like Diocletian launched initiatives to to physically punish the Christians, he launched initiatives to do Manichaeism as well. Both of them were hated and they were associated Manichaeism was hated because it was associated with Persia. Right. The Persian enemies. So it was the enemy within. It was like a to be a Manichaean in the late Roman Empire was people suspected you of Persian sympathies. So that's why it was scapegoated. Christianity was scapegoated for other reasons, but they both had this period of social solidarity. Right. So when Christians and Manichaeans were both being um, publicly tortured and and brutalized. Right. That would have formed a bond between them. They would not have, in that, that moment, seen themselves as different. And sure enough, Manichaeans went through a period around the, for around 40 to 50 years after the Edict of Milan, Manichaeism was officially tolerated. Hmm. Under Christian, the, the Christian Empire officially tolerated Manichaeism for decades following the Edict of Milan, because the Edict of Milan, remember, was a general toleration. It wasn't just for Christians. The Edict of Milan, the text of it was that was religious persecution will cease. Mm -hmm. We're no longer going to persecute the Christians. They're fine. It wasn't until later, right, that Christianity starts to persecute other religions. In that early period, you have Manichaeism and, and Christianity emerging as, as institutions in Egypt side by side. And furthermore, the Manichees, so what was the, do you know what the, the major heresy controversy was around the time of Constantine? What's the big, the big heresy around the time of Constantine? Why the did the big, Council of Nicaea, what? Yeah, the big, I think, isn't it uh, particularly, well, when they're dealing with the Trinity that some thought that he wasn't God? Right. So Arianism, right? Arianism, yeah. Ar Arius at the Council of Nicaea. So the big targets for heresy hunters early on is not Manichaeans. The big targets for heresy hunters early on is Arians. And the and Manichaeans had no problem saying the Nicene Creed. So if you went up to a, Manichae a Manichaean person and said, do you have a problem seeing that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are co-eternal and equal in power? And, and age, right? They go back to whatever the beginning, like the the this sort of hard form of Trinitarianism that emerges as doctrinal or orthodoxy mm -hmm. after the Council of Nicaea. That Manichaeans could pass that test. They had no problem endorsing the conclusions of that council. So that was part of how they kept going under the radar. It wasn't until the time of Augustine that they got really attacked for being heretics within the Western church. So my argument is that that is a plenty of time, right as monasteries are getting set up for a feedback loop where the content that has been mainstreamed into Manichaean monastic life by their synthesis of Buddhism and Christianity, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that can then be at the ground level at the root of monastic Christianity in Egypt. Wow. All right. Next slide. 
we can fly through some of these. You, you didn't talk about rosary, but you did. Oh, yeah, rosary beads. That's another – throughout Central Asia, like Muslims, Buddhists, uh, everybody uses prayer beads for counting. Right. Where does that come from, right? It's a Buddhist thing first. It's it's part of the sort of popular religion of the trade routes. Though, so we're talking about a generic kind of Central Asian popular religion that makes it – that leeches into Western religion. Um, and then, oh, the incense sensors. You know, when when priests carry the the chain bulbous chain metal chain sensors and swing them, yep. and the smoke goes. Buddhist monks and Christian monks. That is again, that's a very specific piece of material culture. The fragrant burning essence carries the the sense to heaven. Right, you're carrying divine favor with the use of bells and smells. The bells and smells that we talk about when we talk about Western. Old order, Orthodox, and, and Catholic Christianity are held in common to Central Asian Buddhism, hmm. right? Before Buddhists were doing it earlier. So, so pretty much anytime you hear someone say, <laughs> we learn everything's pretty much coming, everything good is coming out of Christianity. You hear these things with arguments of morality or this or that. You should pause for a second and just go back and look at the history. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not knocking Christianity, or and I'm not. And I'm also not a mythicist. I'm not no, saying that its core features are borrowed from Buddhism. I'm saying right. a and lot I of would the even, way it's practiced. I think well, we could do that even with morality. Like, right. I'm just yeah, pointing yeah. It out, but I don't want to get lost in that. Oh yeah, no, no. I, I I'm not here to tell any, and I am so indifferent to what other people choose to believe. So, of course, I have I have zero dog in the in the whether or not you believe one religion or another race I no 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 and I'm, that's not I guess what i'm getting at is it's like i think the more we learn the history of of these ideas the less we can pretend well uh, everything was just given to us through christianity and it's like when i hear that argument it sounds like an ignorant person who's not aware of how much synthesis from other right. traditions cultures practice morality uh, concepts, the whole nine that Christianity is actually sucking into it. And so the people who yeah. are using it as a weapon today in today's thought acting as if we owe everything to Christianity, then we might as well say, sure, I'll grant a lot of this stuff to Christianity as much as I would say Christianity owes these other places that they're borrowing and taking their ideas from. And those places borrow from places. And you know what I mean? Like there's so, no, like this really, is like, Really quickly, because it's a different topic, maybe for another day, but mm -hmm. really quickly on that note, I'll say it goes both ways because right. of the Manichaean synthesis. So I argue that Manichaeism is like the back door of Asian religion into Western religion at the crucial like ground level of its institutional formation. That's I, I strongly believe that. Yeah. The same thing happens in reverse in in China, where uh, or the, I should say that the direction of influence in China is as a result of Manichaeism there, where it's a form of Buddhism. So in, in, in the West, it's a form of Christianity. Right. In, in the East, it's a form of Buddhism. So as a result of Manichaeism being a form of Buddhism for a thousand years in Southern and Central China, lots of ideas from Western religion get brought into Chinese popular religion, including things like the whole messianic expectations, right? Because right? who is Mani is a messianic figure. He is taking Messianic Jewish Christianity and turning it into a Buddhist thing. Mm. And therefore, you see things like rebellions and, and various th events in Chinese history that have explicitly Manichaean ideas involved. And you could say that's so, you know, so these, these human religions are related to each other. It's like they have like DNA in common that comes not just from like primordial origins, not just from their beginning of time, the fact that we're all human and we're all trying, mm -hmm. but but there are like real historical links that are maintained, like cross-pollination, cross-fertilization of the soil of these places. Right. Because of these movements like Manichaeism. Please Thank go you. to the next slide. I, I may have mentioned this already, just briefly, that before Mani, there's this Clement of Alexandria. He's the Egyptian early Christian father who write, writes favorably of the Buddha. And this is goes back to what I was saying about 
We don't know much about early Western Greek Buddhism because none of the paper sources survive. If I could magically re uh, reconstitute a lost text, it would probably be a, any Greek Buddhist scripture. I would love if that could just come back, but they're gone. But we have a hint that both Mani and Clement were dealing with a form of Buddhism that's a little bit different than the others. And that is because, for example, they both mentioned seven, si well, hold on, I should say, Mani mentioned seven Buddhas, and then he mentioned an important semi-historical, semi-mythological Scythian or Scythian philosopher named Anacarsis. So the name of this particular Scythian philosopher, Anacarsis, comes up in Mani's discussion of seven primordial Buddhas. The fact that Clement of Alexandria, writing before Mani, also mentioned seven Scythian sages and then the Buddha. He mentioned seven Scythian sages, he mentions Anacarsis, and then immediately he talks about the Buddha. That Those associations of those names in that sequence suggest that both Mani and Clement were probably dealing with the same extinct form of Persian Buddhism. Right. So this would be a Greco-Persian sect of Buddhism that's not identical to the ones that we see surviving in in Sri Lanka and China and Tibet, you know, that that Buddhism changes when it migrates. And so when it moved west, it became a Western form that is now lost, but may survive pieces of it survive from our in things like Manichaeism. Okay, next slide. One one quick comment, if I can, yeah. is just, I'm thinking of, because I've been doing a lot of Enochian literature lately, and, you know, we're talking first century BCE, uh, even into the first century CE, um, there's like a continuum of this literature of Enoch, and I've shown and used people like Seth L. Sanders and other academics that there's a genetic connection between what happens in Persia with the Aramaic connecting these ancient Babylonian and Mesopotamian myths of Adapa, Atana, and the sage, these uh, sacred sages, which are semi-divine figures. Right. And if you look at like the ancient Sumerian kings list and stuff, you have seven figures leading up to the Ad Adapa character or Atana, yeah. depending on the myth. And I'm wondering, yeah. it, I don't know why, but I'm wondering if there is some connection to Mesopotamian uh, legend and myth into or culture into the East, which I'm for a book. So this is a book. This is a controversial author. Um, can, can your viewers see me right? Because yeah, okay, see so this is a controversial author, Christopher I. Beckwith. He wrote Greek Buddha. If you're interested okay. in this topic, this is a this is a good book to check out. He definitely maintains that Buddhism, early Buddhism, has uh -huh. a strongly Persian and Zoroastrian influence. So he would ab he would definitely agree with the notion that early Buddhism gets a direct influence from the greater Persian Empire as Buddhism leaves on the overland routes. It leaves India and goes into Central Asia and the Persian speaking world, the mm -hmm. Indo-Iranian world. That's where you and it's probably the case that that's why Buddhism has like heaven and hell. Got it. Right. And 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 the notions of karma as being like um, sin, sin where, where your karma affects your rebirth status. Yeah, we reincarnate. Indian religion has reincarnation. Western religion has heaven, hell, and the day of judgment. But Buddhism is kind of have both, right? Buddhism is because you can reincarnate in heaven and you can reincarnate in hell and you'll be there for an eon and then you'll reincarnate somewhere else. But you know what I mean? It's not, it's not <laughs> permanent. But the fact is, is that these, 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 you know, the fact that your actions in this life affect your rebirth status in the next life and you can be born, you can be boiled alive for an eon in, you know, a va in a cauldron of whatever, uh, all that stuff, it's there too. Buddhism is there too. So yes, the emperor Diocletian, last of the barracks emperors, he's the guy who scapegoats Christians and Manichaeans. He, um, he also Persianizes the Roman Empire. How does he put a stop to the the massacring that's going on? Like all the, uh, the he was a barracks emperor, but he he adopts Persian court rituals, 
when we think of a when we have a picture of a royal a European royal king wearing purple robes and fancy metal stuff on their heads and you know scepters and things like that, we're not actually picturing ancient European royal customs. We're picturing a Diocletian's adaptation of Zoroastrian court ritual for a Western audience. Right. So he he basically so the reason why the Barrett emperors were always assassinating each other is because the democratic ethos of ancient Rome was that the emperor is like us. The emperor is one of us. He dresses like us. He sleeps in the same tents with us. And so when the emperor pisses off the guy next to him, out comes the gladius. <laughs> you know, the short sword ends up cutting his head off or whatever. And so you mm -hmm. end up with this extreme uh, period of destabilization as a result of the proximity of the sword, the dudes with swords to the dude with the, the power. He realizes you have to have a much bigger wall, firewall between the emperor and the and the guys under him. And it's and right. it's that. So it's Diocletian's reforms that make the late imperial period thrive again. Right. That puts an end to this period when like under Constantine and later, the army is much bigger. It, we, we think of Christianity as the period of the decline of the Roman Empire. But actually, the, the, ad, the adoption of Christianity was a revitalization of late Rome. It was it was what put a stop to the decline that had been going on in the third century. OK, because that because remember, it's 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 one of his tetrarchs who is Constantine's father. Right? This is this is the, the period right before Christianity takes over. So here's just an example of a piece of art that gets adopted into Buddhism and Christianity. This is the Good Shepherd, right? Which originates as Hermes carrying the ram, Hermes the ram bearer. So you can see the Good Shepherd was a way, a crypto-Christian kind of thing. It was a way Christians could have something that looked pagan, but actually be Christian. We're going to rename this guy. He's not Hermes anymore. He's Jesus. And, you know, uh, with, with the Good Shepherd. And so really, really popular. One of the oldest Christian art motifs. There is the Good Shepherd on a pillar in a Greek Buddhist statue. Right? So that, the, oh, that's the right. birth of the Buddha. The top birth of the yep. Buddha. He's born miraculously out of the side of Queen Maya. So Queen Maya, who her, her she doesn't give birth the natural way. She gives birth like through her rib cage. Mm -hmm. And that is um, depicted there. And, and the fact that there is a Hermes on this wall is just an indication that the same Hellenistic motifs were present in both situations. But this is not a case where you have direct, like, Buddhist influence on Christian art. So next slide, I think I have arrows. See, yeah. it's just showing that, um, it's just showing that the, the same Hellenistic precursor is adopted independently in Christian and Buddhist context. There's no need for a back and forth explanation. But with other examples, I think that's not the case. So skip forward one more slide. The triad representation is where you have the Buddha flanked by Hindu gods or Indian god, in Brahmanical polytheistic gods. So here you have the Buddha. This is the Kanishka casket from the second century. Um, so you had um, cremated remains of a Kushan king. So he's one of these tribal Persian Greco-Buddhists. And they have... Um, uh, and so his his cremated remains would be in this box. But here you have the creator Brahma, so the creator God Brahma, and the king of heaven Indra, who is similar to like Zeus or Hercules. You have these two deities both worshiping the Buddha, right? You see that? Yeah, makes okay, me so think of Elijah is, and Elisha on the Transfiguration. <laughs> anyway, but right? That's yeah. So so basically, what this is is it's Buddhism saying Brahmanical polytheism is subsumed and superseded by Buddhism, right? So it's supersessionist because Brahmanical polytheism, which becomes later, we call Hinduism, but at the time it would have just been Indo-European polytheism of India, right? The Buddha is a man, he's a human being, but he's superior to the gods. Right. The gods are like, we're not worthy. They're wow. like, they're like, they're, they're bowing in observance of a human. So that's a big deal. So that's a very early art motif is this triad representation. Go to the next slide. Here is two examples, one from a Christian sarcophagus and one from a Buddha, another Buddhist one. So the one up top, top, the one up on the left is pagan. That's the Melfi sarcophagus, which is, uh, it's got like Helen of Troy and like Athena 
and a bunch of pagan gods. And you see how the, the, the dudes are, and, and ladies are under colonnades, niches mm-hmm. and colonnades, right? Right. So the Bimaran casket, this is another example of one of the oldest depictions of the Buddha. Like that coin that I showed you earlier, this is one of the ones that's like first century, really old, maybe second century. And you see, it's a go- again, it's a gold casket. It's a gold box for relics, for yeah. cremated remains that are venerated. And you see, again, the Buddha flanked by Indra and Brahma, who are paying reverence to him. That's the triad rep- representation. Look at the early Christian sarcophagus on the bottom left. That is Christ mm-hmm. in the middle, flanked with by with his hand up in a gesture of reassurance. The Abaya Mudrai said he is flanked by Peter and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles and the apostle to the Jews. And what is he doing there? He is he's saying paganism, Greek paganism, and Judaism are what? Both brought together underneath the new religion of Christianity. They, the, so the two shall become one, mm-hmm. right? The Gentiles and the Jews are now united by their common province of, of promise of salvation. And he's got the scroll. He's dispensing the law, the new covenant, right? He's got, he's got the paper mandate, which he is handing to his apostles here while he's making this gesture of reassurance. What is the Buddha doing in that scene? The Buddha is coming down from Tushita he- heaven and dispensing the law. He is had, the law is Dharma. So he is coming. He's gone up. He saw his dead mother in heaven. And now he's because he's not dead yet. He's he can go anywhere he wants. He's the Buddha. Right. So he's gone and visited heaven, seen his dead mother. And he's coming back down to earth. And he's being followed by Indra and Brahma, who are like, oh, and and he, you know, they're like fanboys. And he has what he's got his hand up in the gesture of reassurance and he's dispensing the law so it's it's an old motif called the lawgiver motif traditio le- legis i believe right it's the it's the it's a it's a stock motif in roman art that goes back a long ways where you have you know basically like a an emperor with a retinue and he's giving a command so he's got like his you know so it's an imperial image and it has imperial metaphors so it, here is it's being used in two different contexts, one Christian and one Buddhist, but the Buddhist one is older. So people, so go go to the next slide. Again, so I this is just where I articulate in, in text what I just said, that supersessionism right. or replacement theology, the notion that the earlier religions are completed and replaced by the later ones. Guess what? Guess what? Monarchism did it too. Monarchism said that Monarchism does what? It takes Christianity and Buddhism and brings the two together. So that try that that notion that a new religion comes along and it doesn't abolish the old ones, but it completes mm-hmm. them. It puts the finishing touches on the old religion so that like they Islam. are now transformed. Yeah. Islam does the same, and that's right. Islam is Ju- with Islam, it's Judaism and Christianity. Right, exactly. it's the same. So it's like this. It's a common formula and i'm saying it starts with buddhism got it It starts with buddhism doing it with the 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 various polytheistic traditions of india which are represented by like the the warrior caste the uh the 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 priestly caste brahman brahmins and you know indra would have been associated with the kings like the political leaders brahma would have been associated with the religious leaders in ancient india right okay okay and so uh, go one, one more slide ahead to get the little arrow. So the question is, is this like Hermes Cryophoros, which we showed you before? Is this like the, the Good Shepherd? I'd say no, because the, the pagan art there is not as old as the Buddhist art. That Melfi sarcophagus is not, it's, it's made after the Buddhist example. And hmm. it doesn't have the common symbolic inventory. So, so... It's not a situation where it's in traditio leg, legis is independently adapted from a Hellenistic precursor in both geographically removed areas. One skip right. ahead. Okay. See, I've changed the, the the arrows now on my little scribbles. Right. So what I'm I think it is much more much easier to maintain that the Buddhist 
one is the precursor to the Christian one here. Again, because of both the supersessionist content and the hand gesture, right? That that yep. hand gesture is key. You see that hand gesture meet with the same meaning in early Christian art a lot. And it's not the only one, but it's probably the best the most like because it's like the earliest buddhist mudra that's constantly that's regularly depicted so i'd say that hand gesture along with things like rosary beads and halos right are all part of that sort of symbolic inventory that you see shared between the two religions next slide i think we're i think you know i have a lot more slides because there's a ton of this stuff and i love okay. talking about it but i really don't want this just to be me blathering at you if you ever want to take a break and deal with super chats, I, I you know, yeah, I, I'm questions. fine. I mean, I don't have a problem if, unless you think we need to split this up into no, live streams, but I just, I'm, I'm all good. I, I, I have to leave in probably 40 minutes, so I, I can keep going. So then let's, let's pause here and see if we can't pick up and do another live stream when you have more time, because there's so much more to unpack. If that's cool with you. Um, either way, I mean, I'm also happy to just, you know, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. You, well, you, I say that because there's super chats and I don't want to leave people hanging. There's a lot. Yeah, of so them. let's not leave people hanging. Let's take as many super chats as you want. I would love to answer any questions. The, the, oh, yeah, you just fly here. Fly through some of those images really quick. So just this, that is an example of, again, this sort of late Roman art style uh -huh. in Christian and Buddhist art. Look at the way that the body positions are. Then the next one, these are among the earliest representations of Jesus in three-dimensional sculpture, right? Yeah. There's earlier paint wall paintings of him, but you don't, it's when you get, and look again, look at that. So the Jesus is on the right, the Buddha is on the, Buddha is on the left. I see these as having like real, real resemblance and echo. So that's it. I think that, that that's enough slides for now. And okay. yeah, maybe we'll do another, another live stream. I'm about to get started with the semester. So it's going to be. It may be a little tricky, but we'll we'll do our best. Absolutely. And there's so much here that just makes me like I think learning the history, approaching this and learning this stuff is just fascinating to see how how and why and in what ways these influence. What were the ideas that rose up and stuff? So I think anybody who's a history buff or even interested in these things, this is important to know. So you, you've brought up a lot of cool things. So let's start the Super Chats. Stop scamming, man. Thank you so much for the super chat. In the bio of Apollonius of Tyana by a Roman named Philostratus, it speaks of him going to India and portrayed its wise men in high regard. While maybe not accurate, it gives insight into their outlook. Yes. And I, I, I agree with that, that there was a very positive view of India, particularly in ancient Greece. So India was not considered to be a place where um, bad religions were practiced, right? There was, and there was a recognition of a kinship between the forms of Indo-European polytheism practiced in both places. And when Buddhist art was adapted for a Greek audience, they made connections between the, the same deities in different contexts. What do I mean by this? Like Indra, who I mentioned, Indra is conflated with Heracles. Right. Heracles and Indra are actually relate distantly related because they are both uh, Heracles is the son of Jupiter and Jupiter is in, in in cognate with Diuspiter in Sanskrit which is another name for Indra. Right? So these are linguistically linked Indo-European king of heaven guys with the lightning bolts who slay hydras, right? They have the same right. they're some of the same mythological motifs connected to Indra and Heracles, and they made this connection. And they said, when we were de depicting the god Indra in Buddhist art, he develops, they say, and you're a Greek sculptor, you're, of course, going to say Indra is Heracles. And as right. a result, we see features of Heracles in Japanese Buddhist art, right? You go anywhere you see Indra in a, or, or in some other deities too, anywhere you see the, because Indra becomes like a protector of the, of the Buddha. He's like a guardian of the Buddha. He's like a, his wrath is now directed in service of Buddhism for Buddhism, right? And so in Buddhist art, Indra has this like wrathful protector deity guise, and it developed and it absorbed from Hercules. Yeah. Wow. Well, and then why did Buddhism become a bad religion in the West? Because of Manichaeism. Manichaeism was hated, 
And so people wrongly thought the Buddha was a disciple of Mani. So in later literature, they said, who's this Buddha guy? He was some Manichaean. And Manichaean is, Manichaeism is hated now. So Buddhism developed a bad reputation by association with the hated local heresy of Manichaeism. So, so it's only in the early period, right, before Manichaeism gets persecuted, that Buddhism is treated with a lot of respect in Christian sources as, mm -hmm. as like a cool religion that those that those cool Indian people are doing. All right, next. Thank you, thank you. Next super chat. Uh, Mahendra Acharya, Achara, forgive me. He is wrong. Yes. Anthropomorphization of, of divinities, divinities in Sacred India was... was, was yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to read He's it? He's wrong. Anthropomorphization of, di of divinities sacred in India was a result of contact with Greeks. I think that that's what I said. Now, there are, there are different schools of thought on this. There are some people who believe it independently happened in southern India as well. But certainly in the Gandharan case, so in other words, Buddhist art moves in two different directions. It moves south and it moves north. It's the northern branch of the expansion of early Buddhism that is associated with the synthesis of Greek stuff. So I don't know exactly what your friend is saying I'm wrong about. I'm right. happy to be corrected by someone who knows better than me. I'm not I'm not e being egotistical here. But yes, the, an, icon, an iconic representation that I was referring to, the Bodhi tree uh, crossed... Um, Crossed fly whisks, which are like royal standards, right? Uh, parasol, which is a, a royal uh, thing that, that an attendant holds up to keep the sun off a royal person's head. Because the, the Buddha was a prince, right, who abandoned his, his, his princely duties. The symbols, the trappings of an ancient Indian royal life are used as symbols for the Buddha the wheel of Dharma that he turns, right? right? The footprints that show where he walked. So I think I'm agreeing with this person. I don't see <laughs> where they're correcting me, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yeah. And I love the whole ana anaconism, ana however you pronounce that. A anthropomorphization of divinities, right? Where right, you take, right, right. I mean, the same thing happened like in Shintoism, for example. Originally, Shintoism was animistic, and all the deities were like nature deities that had no physical human form. But right. then the Silk Road trade brought like art from that was realistic representational art from Central Asia that was again yeah. distantly related to Greek art. And it comes yeah. through into early Japan, and all of a sudden, Japanese Shintoism, the polytheism of that religion, stops being purely animal or animistic, you know uh nebulous non non-human like creatures and becomes you know where the, the, the deities get named the kami in, in japan get named and take on human attributes right and so yeah this is a pro this is, has happened many times before in the past it happens in ancient india it's associated with early buddhism as a missionary religion expanding out of india there are two different camps some believe that the, the indigenous form is slightly earlier than the greek form the, the indigenous South Asian form is slightly earlier than the Greek form. But in terms of dating the artifacts, there isn't enough precision for one of these two competing views to win the day. Got so it. it's certainly safe to say that the, the Greeks were the earliest ones to do it in the region we're talking about. Got it. Because we're not talking about su Southern Buddhism. We're talking about Northern Buddhism. Heng Fashi, thank you so much for the super chat. As a practicing disciple of Shaolin, one of the things that fascinated me about some of the Gong Fu forms was how they incorporated Buddhist mu mudras. Is mudras, there any yeah. evidence of mudras being borrowed by early Christian or Jewish art? Yes, and I was getting into that. Some of my later slides, we're going to get into some, some, some different examples. They kind of go their own separate ways. So like Orthodox Christian iconography, think of or Orthodox Christian iconography. There's tons of symbolic hand gestures, right? Where you see any Orthodox icon the hands mean something. They are communicating information when the Jesus, when Jesus has two fingers up or three. I don't know them all. You know what yeah. I mean? When, when, the Jesus, when Jesus or a disciple is doing something with their hands, you can read explicit information from that depiction from that. So not the, 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 the languages of hand gestures are not identical in Buddhist and Christian art, but they have a number of hand gestures that do appear to be similar. One of them is, of course, the mudra of reassurance, 
that mudra of fearlessness that I talked about, the right hand held forward, which is again, one of the earliest, one of these symbolic hand gestures you see in either art form. But there are some other ones, some, uh, some in Central Asia, some scholars have made arguments that in Central Asian Christian art, you get very close relationships between Buddhist and Christian hand gestures. Thank you. Hank, for, thank you for the super chat, my friend. Stop Scamming Man says, is that a menorah on the coin? Also, it's interesting. Both religions have halos in their iconography. Do you know how far back halo iconography goes? So I didn't think I saw a menorah on the coin. I, I forget. I, I don't have the, we don't have the coin up on the screen right now. I don't know what that is. I, I maybe a, a, a colleague would know better. It's only got four candles on it. If it was a menorah, it's, yeah, I'm sure that there is a standard interpretation of that. But again, we're dealing with really early stuff here, so it might not have an obvious explanation. But gotcha. I don't believe it's a menorah. Thank um, you. Steps. Both, oh. yeah, both halos do have it. Both religions do have halos in their mm -hmm. iconography, and the the piece from Egypt that was discovered has an extremely Persian style halo because it has the sun rays. Uh, can you zoom in on that a little bit more? Yeah, you can sort of see it there. See how see how it's not just a blank solar disk. The, the halo is like the sun yeah. disk, or you see the sun, a, yeah. or the aura, the aura of holiness that emanates from the the crown chakra, the seventh chakra, which is the 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 top of the head. That's where your like your life force leaves you when you die. It goes through that, right? And so so if you are a very holy being, what what what's your life force doing? Your aura is like shining, radiating out of your crown chakra. So that is how it's interpreted in Buddhism. But it's an old Persian thing to have solar rays coming out of the icon iconography. But it gets adapted into early Buddhist art and then later into Christian art. Hmm. Right? So, so the later form of the, the halo behind a saint is a Christian thing. What I'll point out, uh, remember how I said there's seven chakras and seven yeah. sacraments? Yeah. They don't all correspond exactly, but there are some interesting parallels. The seventh sacrament, extreme unction, is the last rites. So when a, when a Catholic priest goes, where do they put the oil? The seventh mm -hmm. sacrament is, pla is oil placed on the crown of the head before you die and your soul leaves your body through the crown of the head, the seventh chakra in Indian religion, right? So... These are it's a it's a weird coincidence. I'm not saying that those are that, that those are definitely historically related right. ideas, but it's just really a weird coincidence. Or what's what's the other one? The root chakra. Do you know what the root chakra is? No. The root chakra is your ass. The root chakra is where you defecate and your genitals. And why? It's and it's active when you're a baby. So the root chakra rules your body when you're an infant and you're pooping in your diapers all the time. What's the first sacrament? infant baptism got it right so so you get this or, or or what's the heart chakra the fourth chakra is the heart chakra what that's active when you get married like you're a young a young adult gets married they're ruled in in, in indian thought you're being ruled by your fourth chakra when you're uh, uh in love a young right. adult getting married right and that's right. the fourth sacrament is marriage right so they don't all line up perfectly but there's like this weird like weird similarity between the chakras and the sacraments. What I love about what you're saying, just to be goofy as we move to the next super chat is that none of what you said gets into, I don't mean this disrespectfully. I mean this sincerely into woo woo. Okay. So there's some who are like so new agey and so like everything matches right. and parallels and genetically connected. What you do is you say, here are the facts, here are the practices, here's this, here's what scholars think. And here's why, instead of like just gymnastically jumping and saying this absolutely connects, right. but it is interesting. Even historically, this is not like a leap to think there potentially is some reality culturally or even practice wise between these things you're saying without getting, like I said, Woo woo -y. Does and So to get into a little bit about my background, I was raised by hippies and my, so in my, um, and I, and, and I had a very large extended <laughs> family. Yeah. A very large extended family with um, lots of different forms of religious. I mean, I had, I have some like, um, I have some extended family who are Jews, but for the most part, my, my immediate influences were Catholic and Protestant. My father's side was Irish Catholic 
My mother's side was Scottish Protestant. So from a very early age, I like was like, what the fuck is pardon my French? Yeah, Sorry, fine. I didn't mean to cuss in your your suit in your live feed. No, you're what fine. The, what as long as no one else is, is ascended. <laughs> yeah. Bleep it out later, please. I got my reputation to to stand up. You know, I, I don't normally do that. But you you I would say, why why are these religions in contact in conflict with each other? Because my parents were like hippies, they were saying, you know, nobody's right or whatever. And they were so they but they also were kind of like had this a little bit new new age kind of Christianity that I was a little bit exposed to as a young kid. But I have like some more um, more conservative evangelicals in, in part of my extended family. So these are people I've known and loved my whole life, right? I'm not, so I was really familiar with the different manifestations of these religions. And, and I recognized from a very young age, they can't all be right, but they're interesting. And so yeah. I developed a kind of a organically into an agnostic who wants to study them. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I did have woo as a teenager. I would have definitely been believing in, you know, like the cosmic significance of the stuff. And I, as I've gotten older, I've become more skeptical, right. but it's not because of hostility towards people that believe that. I think that one possible explanation is it's true, right? And people who believe in religions have chosen to say, to believe in particular religions, have chosen to say that they do so because they think it's true and the evidence right. for them supports that. I have so many people I respect on all sides. I have radical atheists in my family like mm -hmm. some of the most hardcore atheists you've ever met and some of the most hardcore Christians. And I love them all. And so that's the, that's who I am. That's where I come from is a right, person right. who just is trying to make his way in the world and figure out the, the, the best of my understanding what's going on here. And, and just to comment on that, uh, I've had people who go, why you do what you do is because you hate God. Like this is how they interpret it. And I'm like, I, I, can't, no, I can't I'm a, a member of something that I don't really believe in. Right. right. I can't like I, I have no no animosity at all. It's also yeah. why I don't call myself an atheist. I call myself an agnostic, not because. And by the way, we're not going to get into the definition of atheism of here because that's I mean, that's really. But just like Darwin, Darwin called himself an agnostic and rejected the name atheist. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he wasn't deny. He didn't want to deny anything. He just wanted to be un Free? undecided. Right. Free and so I'm sort of in that, you know, I, I'm sort of undecided i get it yeah oh, i mean I call myself, and militantly <laughs> I, I call myself an atheist but i think that pigeonholes me uh, for a lot of people who just anyway well i have no problem with other people them. picking their own names everyone should just yeah. pick their their own thing yeah they call themselves what they want to call themselves hang fishy again thank you sorry if this if this was covered i'm at work so we'll watch later but what are the chances of young jesus running into buddhists while he was in egypt fleeing from herod <laughs> well, that's assuming the historicity of that flight to Egypt, which I think is uh, questionable. It is possible that early, that at the very inception of Christianity, so when Christian events, the ground zero of Christianity, the earliest movement that we know of, it's possible there's some Indian influence at that stage, but that is much more controversial than what I'm doing. It is much harder to prove, right? When you look at, I think like Zacharias Thundi, T-H-U-N-D-Y, wrote a book called, I think it's, what's it called? Bud about Buddhist and Christian nativity stories. Um, I forget that it's, it was published by a serious academic press. It didn't make a huge impact in the field, but I think he makes the, the claim that, yeah, the evangelist Matthew, we call Matthew, is probably influenced by Persian Buddhist sources mm -hmm. in, in the way that, the, in, particularly in his nativity account. There's okay. a lot of parallels between the Buddhist nativity story and like particularly in one of the first century Buddhist nativity story called Lalita Vistara, I believe is the, I might be pronouncing that name wrong. I'm bad with my instant recall of Sanskrit, but it's one of the most popular early Buddhist nativity stories and it's definitely the same genre that we see in in christianity right like matthew and luke they're they're producing the same genre of literature that you see in the indian version okay it which suggests that the genre the nativity story right is a it's a genre that transcends ancient israel right it goes out of the region okay. where we see it in the west and includes stuff in south asia too there's probably other lost that. sources that are similar. 
Dr. Richard C. Miller shows several parallels between the Matthews birth narrative and Alexander the Great's birth narrative, right. which you find in Plutarch. What I find interesting is maybe, just maybe, here's the stew of right. the East and the West and the, and the right. Hellenism. Uh, it's really, really right. fun. I, I think yeah, but again, but the details are not concrete enough for me to sit here and stake my reputation on that, that, right. that on Thundee's work. I like Thundee's book. It, it influenced me and inspired me earlier in my career. I, I recognize now that it's not as it doesn't it wasn't as solidly argued as it could have been, but like particularly like Simeon, like the, the the old man who says who weeps because he won't live to see the child grow to his potential. That mm -hmm. character is found in Matthew and in the Buddhist source. There's a couple of other ones like when the heavenly hosts proclaim, right? Like that, they're like there's parts of the narrative that are eerily similar. Yeah, to, between Buddhist and and Christian, in terms of you know him encountering practicing Buddhists, I'll say it's possible, but I have no evidence, Got and it. that's why I've chosen to focus more on the period when Christianity is getting established as a religion, rather than the period when the founders were like doing the things that the Christians write about. I get it. No, thank you for that. And M. Nag in the house. Good to see you, my brother. This is fascinating. I will do some research on this topic. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, my friend. Stop Scamming Man says, have you heard of the Celtic story of a wren perching on an eagle to win a contest? I wonder if it's connected to the Chinese Zodiac animal race story with a rat getting on the ox as per the Celtic migration to China. Um. Okay, so I don't know about the Celtic migration hypothesis because some some people who are nationalists will take one parallel and they'll assume that a particular national origin is like the source and the other one is the recipient. I would definitely say that what that Aesop's fables and a number of other popular legends in European literature and folklore are Sanskrit in origin. What mm -hmm. so what happened is early Buddhists uh, popular literature includes something called Jataka stories. Jataka stories are the previous lives of the Buddha. And they're usually clever animals because the Buddha was reincarnated as all these different animals and people, <laughs> right? Like he's been, he's lived a million times before his final incarnation where he stopped reincarnating because he finally hit Nirvana. Before right. that time, he was like, he was like here in and out, in and out of the world all the time. And he would be like, he'd be like a rabbit and you'd say, oh, I see a starving man. I'm going to jump in his soup pot and boil myself so that he can eat, right? Which is an act of total selflessness, right? Because yeah. the Buddha is like, he is so, or I'm a, I, I, I'm a man and I'm walking on a hilltop and I see a, a, a starving li a tiger who is, who, whose emaciated cubs are about to become her next meal because the tiger is, is starving. So what does right. the man do? He jumps off the cliff, shatters his body on the rocks below so the tiger can eat a meal and feed her, Tiger, tiger cubs and then of course what happens is the tiger cubs reincarnate as the buddha's disciples right so the so, it, so the buddha is back and like you were you were the that second cub the one that had the black spot on its you know tail that was you man and and so like these these stories these jataka stories are incredibly popular and a yeah. lot of them get turned into aesop's fables and other things there were so many of them a number of them became christian saint stories Mm. Right. Like there's at least six or seven popular Christian saints that were originally Buddhist guys that were or previous lives of the Buddha that were then turned Christianized. And I again, I and I think I've said this on your channel before. I blame Manichaeism again. Right. Right. Because right. Manichaeism is like the way that they take Buddhist documents. They give them a Christian gloss. Christians read them later and say, oh, this is a Christian document. Right. And who is the one who's who are the people who are incentivized to translate between the religions? Those people who believe the religions are the same. Got it. The Manichaeans are both Buddhists and Christians at the same time. OK, uh, just one comment. You brought this up before the stream. And of course, we don't need to go in depth about this, but no, I no. thought it was interesting to bring up. You say that there is an account, while there are various forms of how Manny died, the founder of Manichaeism, one of them he's filleted alive, or was it Buddha who's filleted alive? No, and not the Buddha. Mani, Mani is, Mani. He, Mani dies, so the founder of Manichaeism, prophet Mani of Babylonia, he is killed either as a result of starvation in prison or 
He is crucified. Right. In one popular version, his skin is taken off of him and blown into a balloon, which is then his like his his his, his epidermis is made it is displayed on the palace wall of the gate of the palace right after he has had his skin removed from his body what i mentioned is that saint bartholomew who is the apostle who is accused who is uh not accused the apostle who is uh set, attributed as the founder of christianity in armenia mm. armenia is the place that is the one kingdom it was independent of persia and rome right right and it adopted Christianity before Rome, before the Edict of Milan. It became the state religion of Armenia. Hmm. And so Armenian Orthodoxy has the privilege of claiming it's the oldest state-sanctioned Orthodox Christian tradition on earth, even older than Rome itself. But their yeah. legendary founder, Bartholomew, happened to die in almost exactly the same way that Mani did. He gets flayed alive, and then he preaches... The gospel without his skin on but what's interesting about that story is saint bartholomew's um biography has a lot of details in common with mani's biography and saint bartholomew's biography is also even though it's set in the first century it is more historically resonant with the events of the late third century right. when martyrdom is the thing right and when buddhist christians and manichaeans are all doing reliquary veneration they're all venerating the physical remains of of dead people in the case of manichaeans and christians people murdered by the state so the fact that a zoroastrian king of per of of armenia killed um because remember armenia was persian roman sort of they practiced state zoroastrianism too a zoroastrian king of persia killed bartholomew in the same way a Zoroastrian king of Persia, mm -hmm. of, of, I mean, of Armenia killed Bartholomew in the same way a Zoroastrian king in Persia killed Mani. Got it. Now, and so I think personally, as some other people do, that the, that the stories are very related, that these are legends. One is in a Christian context, one is in a Manichaean context, but it's the same story underneath. And even in some accounts, the place, the name of the town where they were martyred is the same. <laughs> right? And that when you see a place name in common between two versions it's kind of like a smoking gun that the texts are actually related to each other i forget the name of the town i don't want to say it from memory because i'll get it wrong i, I get it no worries it's with an a it's like arabian or something like that okay um we have quite a few super chats i'll try to blast I got at least 10 more minutes so i'm not rushing away let's try to rush these things because i don't morning. want to leave anyone hanging if we can yeah. if money so was like an indian night is there any evidence for them in this time and place beyond what's said of Mani? Um, so technically he was not an Ebionite. He was, I think it's the term is Elkisite, but it's related. So in other words, Ebionite is a one word that we use to describe early Jewish Christians. They were not the only group like that, right? There were various groups of baptizing, baptizing people around Mesopotamia and the Levant, and they were moving back and forth between Mesopotamia and the Levant for centuries. Some of them were even pre-Christian, right? Like I, I don't know if you've ever heard of um, the Mandeans, right? Yeah. Who were the who, who claimed descent from John the Baptist's community. They spoke Aramaic. They're they're you know so there are quite a number of these small groups that are practicing various versions of this this faith. So I'm not saying that Mani's parents were Ebionites, but I think they were called Elkisites is the particular sect name, but it is very similar to Ebionites. And so the evidence for Jewish Christianity in Persia and Arabia is enormous. Islam is based on it, right? Why does Islam exist? Because there were tons of Jewish Christians in the yeah, Arabian yeah. Peninsula that were still eating kosher. What's halal dietary restrictions? It's right. like, it's basically... Muslims believe Jesus is the Messiah yep. and they believe Virgin that birth. he is not God. Right. And they still eat kosher. What are the, you know, some, some of Muhammad's own family members were Ebionites or were practiced a form of Christianity. That's more like Ebionite. Right. Right. right Christianity. Right. Yep. 
Okay. Thank you so much. 12 more here. If the number of academics studying Hellenics versus studying Persians was reversed, how different might views and interpretation of interconnectivity be? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't think it's the, the problem isn't necessary. I think there is a lot more interest in the Greco-Roman world in Western academia, right? So the, for, for sure, Persia and Central Asia are neglected in the Western academy. But, my, it, but there's still lots of really good people, much smarter than me. I do not claim to be an expert in the primary literatures we're talking about here. I'm a material culture guy. My PhD is in archaeology and or anthropology with a, a focus on, on artifacts and objects. So I'm interested in art and technology and things like that, and also in religion. But I don't have the linguistic chops to mm. prove some of these like arguments beyond a shadow of doubt on the basis of texts alone. Okay. I know there are a lot of much like people who do Manichaeism, like and do the, the primary texts of Manichaeism that have been discovered as a result of the library cave in Donghuang, China, which is a one of the library caves, which is like a Tang Dynasty document dump, massive repository of documents in in that that is a Chinese cave that has documents in Hebrew, Aramaic. Uh, uh, Chinese, Tibetan, Sogdian, like numerous ancient languages are represented, including a ton of primary sources in Manichaean studies. Mm. The people who are doing that work, all that stuff is still ongoing. There are people who are finding like Manichaean citations of the gospel according to Thomas, right? <laughs> so these Manichaeans use Thomas. We think of Thomas as being a lost, extinct Christian gospel, like that was like in the Nag Hammadi codices and that its its community was extinguished by the church. And we think of it as a lost gospel. The Manichaeans used it for like a thousand years. Yeah. We know this because it influences their writings in ways that are, that we can only now see but because we, we have finding their documents. Wow. It used to be, we were judging this religion just based on St. Augustine's polemics. He was writing all this anti-Manichaean stuff. And so we had this caricature of the religion based on its enemies, its <laughs> former adherent turned enemy, right? So, yeah, okay, we got to get on to another super yeah. chat. Um, okay, Barlam and Je Jehos or uh, yeah, Josephat yeah. is a Christian version of Buddha story. There was a fusion of Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Iran, and Buddha Mazda being a major deity. Right. Okay. So I I think I've talked a little bit about Barlam and Josephat on one of your yep. shows a while ago. Absolutely, Barlam. Barlam is the corruption of Bhagavan, which is a generic Buddhist word for saint and refers to the first monk Buddha saw when he left his palace. And who's the guy who led him, who started leading him on a religious path. Got so it. the Buddha was originally a, a spoiled prince who is like given all this uh, drugs and sex to try and his dad keep him from getting enlightenment because he wanted a, a powerful king and not a... Uh, not a, a religious leader. So when he escaped his palace, he met a monk, and that monk is is the Barlam character in Saint Barlam and Josephat Christian legend. Josephat is Bodhisattva, Buddha. So the Buddha's name gets translated from Arabic, where it's Buddhasaf, because Georgian and Greek scribes didn't notice the difference between the Y and B in Arabic, which are similar characters. So. Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva becomes Yodhisattva. Remember when I did the Yoda episode with you? Yeah. That yeah. was what this was about. Yodhisattva God. or Yoda, Yudasaf. Yudasaf then becomes identified with Josephat, Jehoshaphat in the Bible. Got it. And so Saint Josephat. Um, absolutely. And I think that Manichaeans are definitely implicated in that one too, because Manichaeans were, were tolerated in Persia during the golden age of Islam. So early tolerant cosmopolitan Muslim rulers allowed Manichaean scribes to produce Christianized versions of Buddhist stories. And that's ground zero for Bar Barlam and Josephat. It's during, it's when, it's when Muslims, toler the brief period before Muslims started persecuting Manichaeans in Persia, that Manichaeans successfully transplanted Buddhist stories like Barlam and Josephat into Christian contexts. Sid Dave says Greeks in India converted to Buddhism, Hinduism, and played a major role in spreading Buddhism, and they traded with Egypt. So Buddha story went there. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's that's the physical argu argument we're making. We now right. have evidence of not just one, like one one off. Some Indian shows up and drops an artifact. This is not like some tourist thing, right? right. This is a community based around a temple that went decades, if not a century or more. Right? There was definitely a a, a, a practicing Buddhist community in the Hellenistic mm -hmm. world. And in Sid also follows the first human images of Buddha, Hindu gods and goddesses were made by the Greeks. Buddhist art, uh, Hindu art owes a lot to the Greek converts. As we've said, we, we've, we've, we've been over that and that's pretty yep. much accurate. Thank you. Stop scamming me. Says, Hello, Joseph. Are there any lectures or presentations about Native American religion on YouTube, which you recommend? Oh, that is a hard one. I do study Native American ref religion. So I, it's a topic that I'm very familiar with. Um, because you know, my, my background is an anthropologist, but that is not something I'm familiar with in terms of YouTube. Got it. That is not, I, I, my exposure to YouTube channels, I sometimes stay away from the native American stuff because it's often, um, not accurate. I find, so I haven't, I, I'm not aware of one that is accurate, but I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. And if I find yeah. out some information, I'll tell Derek privately later. Cool. How can we be sure later Persian influence affected Buddhism and that it wasn't a natural development of the same old Indo-European source that both Vedic and Persian culture came from? Absolutely good. A, a brilliant question. We can't. That is most definitely plausible. The reason why is because we're dealing with the period before the institutionalization of all these religions and India and Persia come from the same branch of Indo-European. So Indo-Iranian Indo-Iranian culture, which goes from Northern India all the way through Mesopotamia is what we're talking about here. And Buddhism is a product of early Indo-Iranian culture. Beckwith, I said, he's a very controversial guy. Beckwith says he thinks that the Buddha was, was a Scythian, I think, hmm. which would put him in more up in the, in the, um, the Persian zone that we're talking about. But Indo-Iranian, India and Iran were not separate planets. They were even closer to each other than, say, Persia was to the Greeks, right? They were, there's a lot, Zoroastrianism and Hinduism are very closely related, extremely close. There are lots of deities in Zoroastrianism that are also, that have versions in India. So there is no way to, that's a chicken and egg question that's really unanswerable. Okay. Would you consider Hinduism to be the last thriving original Indo-European religion? Hinduists, Zoroastrianism, descended from yeah. the same religion. In that yeah, so I would say when you say thriving, certainly in terms of number of adherents, there are hundreds of millions of Hindus pr practicing early, a, a descendant of early Indo-European polytheism. And most of the, most of the, um, European forms of paganism went extinct in the medieval period. Right. Um, parts of Central Europe, there were indigenous forms of paganism that survived into the very late medieval period. And, and as a result, we can see in places like, I think, Latvia and Lithuania, you can see elements of um, folk religion, particularly in rural areas, which might have a stronger connection to the most, the latest forms of surviving paganism, Right. But absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, the only the only possible exception to that would be places like Siberia, where there might have been forms of European Indo-European paganism that were, you know, parts of the really remotest outskirts of Europe. But for the vast majority of people, yeah, Hinduism wins that award. I'm hip fi hip fire these ones if you can. Yeah. You gotta I got, go. I got enough time. Okay, I'm just worried about your time. I, I do have to leave, but 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 keep going. Is there any evidence Jainism influenced Christianity? Jesus's philosophy seems to be about ahimsa and re ahimsa, ahimsa is, is radical nonviolence. Um, uh, there is absolute more like Mahavira than Buddha. Interesting. I um I don't have any concrete information about direct influence of Jainism upon Christianity, but I do know that people have made the argument that Jainism influenced. Manichaeism. Um, I forget. I have cited it in my earlier scholarship, but I don't remember the source okay. off the top of my head. 
But I, if I go back to my own writing, I can find the citation from my 2008 paper on a related If you topic. want, and feel free when you have time, get me some links. I'll add them to the right. description. And for those so, who yeah, are noting so the, out, the, 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 And the argument that the – so the reason why Jainism is not generally reviewed, viewed as an influence is because it's not a foreign missionary religion. Jainism yeah. never really made it as an export, right? It was always indigenous, and it survived. It's, it's the example – of an ancient Shramana movement that survives to this day and is the most conservative. It's like probably the closest to the way it was practiced thousands of years ago, like mm -hmm. right now. It's really conservative compared to say Buddhism, which changes all the time, Got right? It. So so that's the argument against Jain, Jainism influencing other religions. But according to this argument, there may have been some Jains on the missionary trade routes at the time Manichaeism was founded in Persia. And that the evidence for that comes from specific Manichaean teachings about plant souls. Because only Jainism really strongly believes that not just animals, but plants are conscious beings with souls. So that, you know, we, why do you fast? Not just because it's spiritually good for you, because you're not harming the things you have to eat to survive. Got right. It. So when we eat anything, we're killing, even if it's a plant. And so that, that idea is also found in Manichaeism. In fact, it's one of the things St. Augustine mocked. St. Augustine was like, you stupid people, you think plants have souls. It was one of, like, one of the things he mercilessly <laughs> mocked his former Manichaean co-religionists for. And that, that fact is, is like that common thread that only connects to Jainism, not to Buddhism. And, um, and so that's, that's where that argument came from. Courtney Brown says, just saying thanks for a great show and thank you for talking about art and sculpture as part of knowing history. This has been such an informative talk. Thank you. I, I'm really glad that so many people seem to be appreciating this. And This and was a really good show. Um, Imnag, thank you, Dr. Joseph. You have a wealth of knowledge and I have a lot of research to do. Do you believe the Catholic Church knows its history on religion is fake? <laughs> 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 the, well, I have to problematize that the Catholic Church isn't a thing. The Catholic, institutions don't have actual knowledge. People who are Catholic, some of them are incredibly smart. Yes. I have known some amazing scholars who are practic practicing Catholics and yeah. who absolutely did not believe everything was handed down in like this pure and uncorrupted form. And they were open, 100% open to seeing the, the heterogeneous and complicated way that their traditions form over time. And no responsible historian believes that it is like, you know, handed ever, down, ever. unchanged yeah. from, from, from ever. There are certainly a lot of Catholics who are not that well-educated, but Catholicism is too big to define in that quick way. But thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. B-Bear, do you know much about the Katha Upanishad? Where do you date it? There are Christian and Platonic ideas as in there. I don't know much about that. I'm not a, a scholar of Brahmanism, Brahmanical polytheism, Hinduism. I know that it is one of the later parts of the, the Hindu canon, right? The early parts, like the Vedas, like the, the oldest Vedas, that's where you get like the, the branching off point between Greek, Persian, and Indian, the early Indo-Europeans, right? There's a lot in common between the earliest Hindu scriptures the earliest Zoroastrian scriptures and the earliest Greek philosophical texts. They have lots in common, it, indicating they all shared that like pre, that really primordial Indo-European stuff. The later stuff, I'm sure that there's back and forth and and like like they said, later philosophical influences from Greece, these places were interacting, but I don't have the specific answer there. Okay, next. Thank you. On Robertson, just seems all roads lead to Rome and behind that is Thebes. Just seems the Greeks really were everywhere. Scythians or Scythians went to India? Question mark. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm never sure which way I should pronounce that either. Yeah, uh, there's some the hard C versus the soft C is always it depends on who you ask, <laughs> and that's true not just for that word but for most incidences of the 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 letter C in ancient languages. You can kind of go both oh, ways. I, you skipped one. I did. I'm sorry. I'm reading below. Yeah. Uh, apologies. Um, but yeah, you didn't answer that question, I guess, on the Scythians thing. I don't know if you wanted to say, did they go to India? Went to India? Yeah, because it's, well, remember, the Indo, this is what I said before, the Indo-Iranian cultural area is massive. It goes from northern India out into Eurasia. And there's a huge area that goes from western China 
all the way to Europe that include that is Indo-Iranian in terms of its linguistic ethnic culture. So the Scythians were everywhere. They were like some of the most, and they were horse people, right? Right. And they rode through the arid steppe corridor. So those folks made it absolutely around, and they were instrumental in the spread right. of ideas from one area to another. Okay, and then Rum Runner said, it's important to note that most Buddhist stories were never taken literally, even early on. They're myths that use skillful means to tell truth. Yeah, and well, that is a philosophical Buddhist statement, and many people who are particularly Western converts have that attitude. But folk religion, go to like a small Buddhist village. I, there's a lot of people who are just like worshiping the Buddha like a god, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? There is So there's a big difference between academic Buddhism versus popular Buddhism. And that's right. same true. So the same thing we were talking about with like a Catholic scholar in a university versus your Catholic grandma, right? Yeah. These are two different people and their approach to the religion is, is very different. Thank you for that. And then Joe Medley says, does your work suggest that we should, um, should seek an Eastern origin for the gospel of Matthew, the gospel with the wise men from the East? Has anyone done that? Yeah. So the book by Zechariah Thundi, T-H-U-N-D-Y, that's called like Buddhist and Christian nativity. I forget the exact title. I'll, I'll try and get you, we'll be in, in communication. I'll try and get you some specific citations to append to this. His work is basically maintaining that Matthew is heavily influenced by Persia. And that as a result, it doesn't mean that the, the gospel itself is from the East, but right. he is a Jew with a Persian cultural affinity or co Persian cultural uh, who regards Persia with highly. Obviously, he pre presents the Magi as paragons, right. not as and Magi are Zoroastrian priests. So if he's presenting them as paragons, he's not anti-Persian. Got it. Is that, that's Zechariah Mo Moody? Moodley? Thundi. T- H U N D Y. Okay. Thundi. And then also I would recommend Joe, if you haven't read resurrection and reception um, in early Christianity from uh, Richard C. Miller, he gives a, a parallel showing like comparisons between Alexander the great's birth, where there are these Persian Magi who come from the East as well. I think it's something to that form at his birth. So check that out. And it's contemporaneous with Plutarch writing it. So it might be important to see that as a closer antecedent or some something there, but it's worth checking both out. Um, two more, Andrew. Uh, how does the Euphrates River drying up factor into Revelations? Supposedly, four great demons were imprisoned there, and that kings would invade. I apologize. I know you spent good money on that super chat, but that is not my area. I know some really good scholars of Revelation. I've worked some with some really good scholars. A revelation i find it to be a really interesting subject but it is not my wheelhouse yeah thank you andrew sorry about that uh not being able to give you a good modern hindus is a mix of the vedic religion buddhism jainism the identity of hindus That's right. as a religious group happened after islamic invasions and then british made it a formal organized yeah group. it's that buddhism was ev eventually declines after the islamic invasion buddhism in india but it had, it had transformed what we call hinduism so okay. aspects of Hinduism are deeply influenced by Buddhism. Like Buddhism made an indelible, I mean, so the fact that like the, the flat national flag of India has a Dharma wheel on it, which is originally a Buddhist symbol. Okay. Right. So there's like a Buddhist symbol that has been in a Hindu context, right. That is one of the central state state symbols in India. Got it. Right. So yeah, absolutely. The media that you can't, you can't have a religion be like close to the state religion for, centuries like the better part of a thousand years where it was the most powerful religion in the country you can't have it just go away overnight and not not leave an impact right so hinduism, hinduism would not be what it is today without buddhism thank you and then last one sid dave buddha became east asian when buddhism went to east asia just like jesus became white in europe yes people naturally saw gods were like them yeah absolutely and, and it's also because people weren't familiar with foreigners like, like when people drew pictures of, of people, they drew pictures of the people that they knew and saw. They didn't yes. have photographs. Nobody knew what people looked like on the other side of the planet. And so they just assumed that a person looked like one of them, which is normal, natural. Yeah, it's, not, it's not racist or anything. It's just the way art is done. In if, if, yeah, a lot of people take it that way. And they're like, you whitewash Jesus. And it's like, uh, look no. at Christian art through the centuries. He's wearing a toga. He looks like a, a Roman. You yeah. know, like 
it's because know, they were depicting the people that they knew and saw. Yeah, yeah. Which and is so, the only way you could depict people when you didn't have photographs. Makes me think of Xenophanes. A horse drawing the image of its god looks like a horse, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Any final words from you as we let you go? This was an outstanding episode. We had almost 400 people watching. And I am I'm really pleased that as punch is, that it went this well. I hope to I hope to get this manuscript published at some point, and then we'll have to come back and talk about it again once I have like actual writing to share. Um, but um, I can I will ha be happy when I'm back at my computer later today to send you some some links to include in the comments. Um, at some point, I will become I will come in and respond in the comments section. Cool. Below, if people want to ask me questions there, I can do my best to answer them when I get a chance. And Perfect. it's been a real pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. I want to compliment you and just say um, you speak clear. You say what you mean and mean what you say. And you're very, very good at teaching. So keep up doing that. I always enjoy these episodes because a lot of compliments throughout were like, man, this guy just said and he was very well articulating what he meant. And, you know. I, and by the way, I, I'm also, I hope that this is a good thing. I am willing to admit when I make a mistake and I do not claim to be the be all end all expert on this stuff. One of the hard things about being a generalist and trying to cobble together arguments from really disparate areas is you have to be really humble and you have yeah. to say, this is something that I really believe based on my impression of the data. But if someone who came along was much better, like steeped in that very specific area, then I, I will defer to them every time. Right. I will right. say, oh, my bad. Or but, at least evaluate um, they're, what they're saying and see that there's there's competing ideas about this. And you might say, it could be, they might be right, you know, depending yeah. on, but I get That's it. Right. I'm all about that as well. Um, I, I, I think it's good to defer to the experts who specialize in that. And guess what? They themselves should always be humble and, and, and recognize and change with whatever the data is. And that's the good thing about researching and being a scholar. All right. Well, I do really have to leave now, but uh, fortunately okay. my, my <laughs> appointment is not too far away. So, Well, thank you so much. Everybody have a wonderful day. Hit the like button, share this out, drop a comment, let us know that you enjoyed it and that you want him back. And he'll be talking in the chat. So have a good one. <laughs>